Opposing sides divided by a heavy police presence. Foreshore Park in Newcastle was this morning split down the middle. At one end, supporters of the Reclaim Australia movement. At the other, a counter rally against what protesters are calling Islamophobia. There is nothing to fear from the Islamic faith. There is nothing to fear from the Muslim community. If we want a peaceful, sustainable community, we need to coexist peacefully and embrace each other's differences. Police turned out in force, creating a 150 metre buffer between the two sides. And while all remained peaceful, tensions were obviously high. Reclaim Australia protesters deny they're promoting racism. What they say they are promoting is the Australian way of life, one free of Islamic extremism. Look around you. I don't see any racists here. I see, I see no racists here right now. Um, I wouldn't travel no. three hours to go to a pro-racist rally. I wouldn't waste my time. Now I've got friends of Italian, Greek. I've even worked with Muslims who tell me that they're not happy with what the way, way things are going with the terrorist side of things. Amanda Douglas, NBN News. Bailey Turner is a remarkable 13-year-old. While he might look like your average teenage boy, on the inside, he's suffering. As far as he's concerned, he's lived his entire life in pain. Bailey was diagnosed with juvenile arthritis at just 19 months of age. He also has Crohn's disease, meaning chronic pain is a daily struggle. It stops me from doing some physical things, like soccer and sport and like climbing a tree and everything. And things that other people do. Mum Jo says managing Bailey's pain can be taxing. It's a whole family unit and it is a domino effect that even though you've got one person in pain, everybody feels it. Dr Susie Lord is a pain specialist at John Hunter Children's Hospital. She says chronic pain can make even the simplest of tasks unbearable. People coping with chronic pain are just amazing because they're coping with the everyday things we all do, but then they've got this extra thing that they're managing, this extra thing that requires their energy. On the eve of National Pain Week, the Turners hope by raising awareness they can debunk the stigma faced by sufferers. There's some people who just don't understand what it is and I'm, most of the time I just either ignore them or tell them to go ask, ask their parents or friends about it. He sometimes doesn't speak about it because he doesn't want people to think he's making it up. Even younger sister Violet has a message. Just because you can't see it doesn't mean it's not there. Like, it's like if you're in a dark room, doesn't mean there's no furniture in it. Amanda Douglas, NBN News. Any time, any tide, any swell, wind or size. Words ingrained in Merriweather Beach culture, now written in stone. Today a plinth was unveiled, recognising the surf spot as one of the best breaks in Australia and one worthy of protecting. And it's wonderful to have something that's in legislation that protects our, our break um, in perpetuity, so nothing really can affect it. The reserve stretches from Dixon Park to Burwood and surfers say what makes the area so great is Merriweather's unique combination of rock shelves and reefs. Brad Farmer is the man who co-founded National Surfing Reserves. He gave Merriweather the title in 2009. Newcastle city coastline probably rivals the Gold Coast as the best city coastline in Australia. That's a terrific accolade for tourism and just for the pride of people of the hunter. On hand for the formal unveiling, the man who helped put Merriweather on the map internationally. Merriweather has been very, um, I guess, instrumental in my um, you know, professional surfing career. It's got the best surf in Newcastle, but I don't want to mention that because there's already enough people out there surfing. It's too crowded now. It's a lovely sculpture and I think it'll become a, a place to have a photo taken in Newcastle. Vivian Von Drainen, NBN News.
Sculptor Tanya Bartlett is never far from her studio that's as unique as the work she produces. From here, she's created famous works seen all over the country. I think I'm a bit of a perfectionist like that. I really want to be happy with what I've done. From light horsemen to horse trainers and a blue healer for the town of Musselbrook, nothing is off limits. Her first major piece, legendary Maitland boxer, Les Darcy. I had no real portfolio of large work, so there were 43 odd sculptors that went for the job and many of them well established. You hear the story and he had such humble beginnings too and, and a tragic story too, so it was amazing. But the most pressure she's ever had to endure as an artist was sculpting cricket immortal Don Bradman. It was his wishes that I was the one to do that statue for the museum and and uh, but yes so many people knew him there's so many photographs of him which was actually a positive because it gave me a lot of material this is slim and joy so these were uh, I did the pair of them for Tamworth a couple of years ago now they were quite a challenge for different reasons or well, for slim because he's so well known and has such a huge fan club I love uh, converting the uh, raw piece of stone to a finished work. I love the feel of carving it. I love the hardness of the material, the resistance of it. It's, it's a real pleasure. Nova Castri and Roger McFarlane's latest work will be judged while it's being created out in the elements. People can see what actually goes into making a, um, a large sort of sculpture out of, out of stone, out of marble. It's like people in sports, you know, sports people like to perform in front of the home crowd and I think artists are the same. The six week project is about helping remove the stigma surrounding mental illness. This sculptor travels the world to hone his craft and source materials. This piece of marble from Greece is worth $30,000. It's a beauty isn't it? The, the, the colour's lovely, it's pretty white just with some nice um, grain going through it so it's not too stark but it's also really reflective too. With a large body of work already behind him, one thing he does know, getting it right, is just so important. The sculpture will last for hundreds of years and you don't want your mistake looking at you for all that period of time. So it's really important to get it right. Fellow Newcastle artist Julie Squire's recent creation required just as much work in the installation as it did in the making. Commissioned by Orange City Council, it's an Anzac memorial for the city's main street and there was all sorts of pressure involved. A deadline gets me going, that's a big inspiration, um, take the Anzac Day, it's 100 years and you need to finish this work by a certain date. Researching the subject is another vital element for Julie Squires. It's important for me to ground myself in the work, even if I'm doing like a figurative portrait bronze or something, I feel like I need to get to know the subject matter. Michael Kane, NBN News. Dane Gagai started the game reportedly battling a virus. By halftime, the centre was complaining of dizzy spells and Knight's medical staff decided to send him to hospital. Earlier in the night, Tyler Randall was also ruled out. Just getting his head the wrong side of the wrong man, Dave Taylor. He was cleared of serious damage but will need to follow concussion protocol this week. Overall, the Knights responded with the kind of resolve that's been missing during their recent lean run. Skipper Kurt Gidley got them on the board. No check from Gavin Badger. Kurt Gidley scores his second try for the year. Tarek Sims made it three tries before the break and Newcastle was in control. Despite losing Gagai at half time, the home side's momentum continued. McManus in field. Here's Mullen. First try of the second half, the Newcastle Knights. Randall's replacement, Danny Levi, bagged a try from dummy half as the Knights scored a confidence-boosting win. Gold Coast veteran Nate Miles escaped punishment for this incident but could face further scrutiny. I think it was awkward. I think he had hold of his leg and he, he sort of went to the side, really. It was sort of more the thigh that came down. So I think they saw it for what it was and, and that's it. Rick Stone was happy with his side's effort, especially in defence. Today just shows there's plenty um, of, of spirit and desire in the club and we still want to do something with our 2015 season. Also last night, halfback Adam Reynolds inspired Souths to a 16-point win over the Dragons. 
The Bunnies scored twice in the final 10 minutes to jump into the top four. With the Kibble Mallon Cup on the line, a big crowd turned out for the local derby. Newcastle raced out of the blocks, John Howe and Ryan Beastie making an impact for the Hunters. Maitland's Gore and Veg was a constant threat. He got the Mustangs on the board. Marty Roberts found his range early, knocking down three straight shots from beyond the arc. Down by 10 heading into the second quarter, Maitland's Mitch Rita and Greg Milburn got the Mustangs back in striking distance. Veg provided plenty of entertainment for the fans. Both teams turned up the intensity in defence as the Hunters went to half time in front 37-31. The arm wrestle continued in the second half, Rita fighting to get Maitland within two. But with Ben Hawksley pouring in 20 points, Newcastle refused to give up the lead. Playing his final game for Newcastle before heading to college in the US, Beastie said goodbye with another solid effort in the nine-point win. For Pocobin grape grower Ken Bray, this year's been more challenging than the last. There's been quality, but not quantity. This season, just 50 tonnes of grapes were harvested from these vines, compared to 65 last year.
that looked great coming up to harvest and then we had a lot of rain events which made it fairly challenging for us. Something the latest research from the Winemakers Federation of Australia reflects. This year, 94% of growers in the region won't make a profit and just 1% will break even, leaving 5% with a low to high profit. However, those figures don't include growers who bottle and sell their own wine. Oh, I'll be marginal, but you've got to average that out in agriculture. But overall, the Hunter Valley Wine and Tourism Association believes the local grape growing industry is in a strong position, and that's because of the unique style of wine the region has to offer. The style of wines we're making is where the market's starting to head to. As I said, the authenticity of what we do is what the market's after. Um, you know, we're the oldest wine growing region in Australia, and, and, and that holds a lot of credibility these days. Vivian von Drainen, NBN News. It may not be the original, but its contents are just as important. On these pages, the names of the 187 people who lost their lives while working at BHP's Newcastle Steelworks. The search has been so hard, and for a man of steel like myself and my family, it is unbelievable. It is a holy grail of steel history in Newcastle. Aubrey Brooks has been searching for records of fatalities at the steelworks for more than a decade. That is, until recently, when a book containing priceless details was uncovered in BHP's Victorian archives. I'm so happy today because finally the men and women of steel can march into history. How many people lost their lives? It's, it's a question that everybody has always wanted to know the answer to and no one's ever been able to have an authoritative number. But this is just one piece of the puzzle. There's a gap of information in the first few years at the steelworks and there's another gap for about 12 years in the middle period of the works. BHP says it's still searching on its end and once those gaps are filled the focus will turn to how to best honour the fallen. If we do anything with these names it's got to be perfect. They deserve that. Amanda Douglas, NBN News. We're trying to make sure that the children go to the beach or the swimming pool, have a good time, but they go home safely. put your hand in the air so the lifeguards know that you're there. They taught us about rips, the kind of animals that we need to avoid, how to stay safe at the beach and to keep in the flags. The Knights players didn't find out about Dane Gagai's heart problem until after the clash with the Titans. Since then they admit it's rattled them. He's doing well now, I spoke to him yesterday. He's, uh... I think he's just doing a bit of attention seeking at the moment, but nah, he's all, he's all good. He, I spoke to him yesterday, I haven't seen him this morning actually, so I'll, I'll see how he's doing today. At this stage, they're not sure when the Queensland representative will be back. If Dane feels well enough to play, then by all means play, but I think he wants a bit of a rest to um, these next couple of days and see how he is by the weekend. Corbin Sims was one of Newcastle's best against Gold Coast. Today, he attributed his solid return to form to a club legend. Danny Badiris challenged me to step up and I think I did that game and then um, yeah, you know, like, like you said my form's, form's been not too bad lately, I've still got a lot of areas to work on. As for the team, what's the goal for the rest of the season? Keep winning. <laughs> Start this weekend against the Rabbits, they had a good win, win on the weekend as well so they're always a tough opponent um, no matter what time of the year you play them. Also today the NRL unveiled the Spider-Man themed jersey the Knights will wear against the Dragons in round 21.
A two-week mid-season break from golf doesn't seem to have hurt Jake Higginbottom's game. The 21-year-old has endured an up-and-down year, competing on courses across the Asia, One Asia and Japanese tours. Yeah, it's hard to go up for a tournament, come home for a week and then go up again. Um, it's just hard to get into a bit of a run, I guess. At the same time, his friends have enjoyed career-defining moments. Toronto's Callan O'Reilly won the Tahiti International. It's good for Cal, I mean, he didn't have too much status at the start of the year, so it's uh, nice to see him make a, make a bit of money. His former Australian teammate Cameron Smith burst onto the scene at the US Open. Me and Cameron Smith have been pretty similar all along, so when you see a guy like that do that, it gives yourself, I guess, a sense of hope that you can do it as well. Their form has given Jake the motivation to finish the year on a high and qualify for either the European Tour or the second tier in the US. I should get through to final stage of Europe, so I mean it's hard to give up final stage to go to second stage of America. But hopefully the scheduling all works out and I can go to both. Um, we'll see what happens. It's a result bringing relief to the residents of Northern Lake Macquarie. It was very reassuring. We did not find one child that had an elevated blood lead. Lead can cause serious long-term health impacts, particularly for children and unborn babies. So the need for screening is vital. Blood lead levels have been dropping dramatically since Pasminko closed over a decade ago. Dr Craig Dalton says the latest figures show that trend is continuing. That fresh fume, which was really highly bioavailable, really got inside the body, has now gone with the closure of the smelter. And the residual lead that is in the soil doesn't seem to be leading to an excess exposure among the children anymore. Now, the danger for children lies in exposure to lead paint. It's probably going to continue to be the main source of lead exposure. So lead uh, from old paint, peeling paint, renovations in North Lake Macquarie and elsewhere in the Hunter will probably be our main risk factor for children. For those who missed out on the recent round of testing, a monthly clinic will be held in Warners Bay. The data will now be viewed by the New South Wales Chief Health Officers Lead Reference Group. Emma Murphy, NBN News. It could be the solution to a lack of student accommodation. These are a Sydney developer's plans for a proposed $25 million residential housing development directly across from the University of Newcastle. If given the green light, the three hectare site will see the construction of 10 multi-storey buildings. It comes on top of the uni's recently completed student accommodation project, which almost doubled the amount of on-campus accommodation available. Meanwhile, Newcastle Council will tonight vote on plans for a controversial 16-room boarding house in Walls End. The developer behind the project, BDMG Developments, recently revised the plans after feedback, but that hasn't stopped residents from voicing concerns. I don't know anyone that is for it. Very much against it, totally. It, it's just not practical in this sort of an environment. If approved tonight, the existing single-storey home will be demolished, making way for two new buildings, creating 16 rooms and communal areas. But it's the lack of roadside parking that's become the big issue. We'll be looking at another 19, 20 cars on the street here, and, and that's, with no footpaths, that's totally unsafe. Michael Kane, NBN News.
The Amazon might be one of the most dangerous rivers in the world, but members of this Dragon Boat Club can't wait to experience it. It's a great adventure to be able to paddle down the Amazon. At 180 kilometres in length, the River Amazon International is the world's longest raft race and is even recognised by Guinness World Records. Just getting to the starting line has all the hallmarks of the reality television show, Survivor. They give you uh, eight logs of wood and you've got about, oh, probably about five hours to build it and then three days to race it. The challenge is just number one, to, to paddle it, but probably the bigger challenge is making sure the raft stays together for three days. But there's a very serious side to their mission. Their team name is the Drays, Dad's Rafting Against Youth Suicide. Their trip prompted by the recent death of a club member's daughter. One of Headspace's missions is to take conversations about youth mental health into the community and these guys have got a project which is doing that. We can speak about asthma, we can speak about diabetes, we can speak about breast cancer, but we still have trouble talking about suicide and youth mental health. And the pair has been warned about some of the hidden dangers along the way. There might be a few piranha around but we've been told as long as we haven't got any nicks and scratches on our fingers from building the raft and we wear long fingered gloves, we're pretty well okay. Michael Kane. NBN News. Mark Hughes was the epitome of health, but in 2013 his world changed forever when he was diagnosed with brain cancer. It inspired him to form the Mark Hughes Foundation to raise not only awareness but funding for medical research. Now, one year since its creation, Hughes's dream of being more recognised for his charitable foundation than his on-field action is becoming a reality. Today, the red and blue donned beanies as part of a week-long fundraising initiative, while last night the cause was promoted on the national stage. I'm wearing this because I'm cold and bald. What are you wearing it for? Uh, it's the beanie for brain cancer week. Today, um, I heard on Sterlow's show, uh, Mark Hughes Foundation. Jonathan Thurston made contact with the foundation out of the blue and said get some beanies down to his motel because he wants to lend us support and we all know he's a champion on the field but he's certainly proving that he's an even better champion off the field and the exposure he gave us on Monday night after the game was, was just enormous and we just can't thank him enough. At Hunter Tafe's Newcastle campus, students, the Knights squad and members of the local music scene showed their support. We need to get rid of brain cancer because it's hurting a lot of people, yeah. Alon Silov is a cancer survivor himself. The medical research side needs as much funding as, as we can possibly throw at it. You know, we need to raise the awareness, we need to raise funds so that we can improve patients' outcomes. It's not good enough, we, we need better results. While one student decided to part with more than a few dollars. My mum was diagnosed with cancer, so I thought that would be a really nice way to support her. Emma Murphy, NBN News. I've spoken to a few people over the last couple of weeks, and you know, and um, and you've you've just got to you just got to trust the timing in your life. Things happen for a reason. Clint Newton is old school. Today he told his teammates this would be his last year in the NRL. There was no pre-prepared media release or retirement speech, just a chat with his teammates and the local media. It's a career that's exceeded all the expectations that I had as a 13 year old when I first started and um, I'm really proud of what I've been able to achieve and, uh, and the person I've been able to become. It's a decision that Newton knew was coming but only made in recent weeks. There comes a point in everyone's life where you go, well, you know, um, this, is, this has been unreal, but, uh, but what's next? And I'm excited about the next phase of my life. He debuted for the Knights in 2001. Stints at Melbourne, Hull KR and the Penrith Panthers followed before returning to the Knights at the end of 2013. He was brought back to drive club culture and create change something he believes will take time. There should be no sense of entitlement here. Um, you know, you should, you should really you know, want to be here and, and you should really uh, love what you do. And I think if you're passionate enough about something, you'll be successful. The 34-year-old has ignored offers to play on elsewhere to remain in his hometown long term. I'm most, happy, most happy and passionate when I'm helping people. You know, so whether that's 
um, whether that's continuing on doing something with the Rugby League Players Association or, or something else, then, um, then only time will tell. Aku Uate was on crutches today after suffering a knock to his knee against the Titans. Tyler Randall and Danny Levi didn't work with the main group, nor did Jared Mullen. Both Scott appeared untroubled by a hand injury, while it appears Adam Clydesdale's shoulder is back to full strength. Paddy Kilmurray, NBN News. We're coming out on September 5th, uh, you know, to showcase uh, rugby uh, against the USA Eagles. Um, and, you know, we'll kind of show rugby that way, but we also want to get out to the kids and we're doing a few rugby clinics and uh, show them what rugby's about. I'm joined now by Nick Cummins, also known as the, uh, a.k.a. the Honey Bear, one of the best uh, uh, nicknames in all the sports. We'll get to that in a couple seconds, why they call you that. A public meeting about the future of one of our first lines of defence. Parliamentary committee members gathered this afternoon, tasked with the job of assessing the latest upgrade to RAF Base Williamtown. On the panel, member for Newcastle, Sharon Clayden, who has likened entering the base to walking onto the set of a 1950s movie. I think most people would be, you know, utterly shocked to see the conditions under which defence personnel at RAF Base Williamtown work. The buildings have been generally well maintained but they're just getting old. Um, 
there are many of them that are not compliant with current regulations. The infrastructure in the ground uh, is just suffering from age. More than $250 million is slated for Stage 2 of the billion dollar redevelopment, which includes a five-storey office block catering for around 950 personnel. The project will also feature safety upgrades to Madawi Road. There will be, at this stage, a set of lights going in at a new northern entrance. During today's hearing, Defence Force representatives told the panel the development will boost security capabilities at the base as well as increasing productivity. The overhaul is in preparation for the arrival of the Joint Strike Fighter in 2018. The committee requested more time to consider heritage elements of the proposal before making its final decision. Amanda Douglas, NBN News. Uh, what this does is actually put the hunter uh, on the, uh, on, in the forefront in relation to a place to study and uh, the study hunter is an opportunity to, to really uh, showcase this region as, as a destination for education. It's a moment that shocked a worldwide audience. And the same reaction was felt twofold at J-Bay as Mick Fanning's friends found they could do little but stand and watch. I was really helpless. You know, you couldn't do anything about it. All I was doing was yelling out shark and, and I was kind of actually starting to cry because seeing your mate out there getting attacked. Peter Boscovich, a professional surfing photographer, was working as the incident unfolded. I just saw some splashing. I thought it was him kicking his feet and... It just happened so fast and, I, and the splashing just got bigger and worse and intensified and I knew then there was something bad. On any other day, Boscovich is capturing the moment through his lens, but this time he was paralysed with fear. Everyone knows there's great white sharks around J Bay and I knew it was a shark and, all I, and I was so helpless. He says seeing one of his mates encounter a near-death experience has taken a personal toll. He broke down and just thinking to that now where he broke down, that just still kind of you know, gets to me, as you can see. I'm, yeah, it's pretty gnarly. Boscovich can now take a well-earned break before a photo shoot in Indonesia next month. Paddy Kilmurray, NBN News. So we've tested it on families, we've asked the young people themselves to tell us what's important. So ward information, hospital services, parking. On the weekend, played a full game and um, really impacted the ball around the contest and um, was able to you know, kick two goals and finish off some of that hard work he did through the midfield. Dane Gagai had tests on his heart today. And we'll have more tomorrow, but Rick Stone is making alternative plans. He's in good spirits and good shape at the moment. Um, he's probably unable to train at this point in time. They're still trying to find uh, a little bit of a common theme there, and they haven't sort of found that as yet. It might have been a one-off situation, and you know, um, you know, he, he might may not sort of see those symptoms again. 
Sione Mataudia missed last weekend with a concussion. It's expected he'll be past fit and return to the centres in the event Gagai is ruled out. Chanel Mataudia trained outside his brother today and would be the logical replacement for Aku Uate, who is expected to miss this week's match with a knee injury. If he can't be running freely by Friday, well, he, he won't be playing either. Joseph Tarpany was a surprise omission from the side which played the Titans. He featured heavily in New South Wales Cup, but his coach still wants to see more. He's been attacking really well in the last few weeks, but defensively he's let himself down a little bit and he's the first to understand what the scenario is there. He's got to be more, a bit more consistent with his defence. Jared Mullen looks set to put off toe surgery for the time being at least. Paddy Kilmurray, NBN News. The sport of squash was massive in Australia in the 1980s, but a decline in popularity forced most of our best players to pursue careers overseas. Once I got to university, decided that I'd want to go professional with it, um, and then spent uh, three years over in England and, and four years in America training and basing myself over there to be closer to the events. I've been away for probably the last 20 years, uh, first in Brisbane and then in America, so uh, just come home and settle down in the Hunter Valley and be around my family and friends. Now Matthew Kowalski and Heidi Mather are both happy to be part of the resurrection of the Newcastle Open at South Cardiff. Being a squash player in Newcastle you know 20 years ago is a lot different to now and you know it was booming back then and um, it's really good to see it coming back now. With Aaron Frankham and Michelle Martin unable to defend their titles, the Hunter pair go into the event as top seeds. I lost in the final uh, to a good friend of mine from Sydney, uh, Aaron Frankham. So I um, also dislocated my thumb on the way through last year, so I'll try and avoid that this year too. 118 players took part in the tournament in 2014. Organisers are hoping to better that this weekend. We've got six uh, men's grades, three women's grades, so it's not all about the top players. We'll have players of all different standards, some of the top juniors in New South Wales. Abandoned and attracting the wrong crowd. Now it's feared Newcastle Station is on track to becoming the latest local icon to fall into disrepair. Since the Baird government stopped services to the station last year, security measures including guards were put in place to protect the heritage listed building. Now they've been removed and while on one side of the fence it looks like there's been an attempt to keep out unwanted visitors, just around the corner it's a different story. I've contacted the Minister and asked the Minister to put security back onto this building. It needs to be protected for the people of Newcastle. We don't want to see Post Office Mark II. Newcastle residents have taken to social media to vent their frustration. Some describing the move as a deliberate act of destruction through neglect. What's confusing many is why security guards are still stationed at Civic. They want to demolish Civic Station, yet they've still got security there. I don't know why that is, but they should have security here. 
Transport for New South Wales today told NBN News that, as was always planned, a mobile security patrol across Newcastle, Civic and Wickham stations has now been introduced. And if the department needs to ramp up security further, it will. Emma Murphy, NBN News. For the hundreds who ride on the free shuttle bus to John Hunter Hospital each day, it's a valuable service. I use it quite often, you know, because I go to specialists and I, you know, often go up to the hospital to visit people and it's just so easy. It's really helpful, it comes in handy uh, at times when I haven't got any money to pay for parking. Convenient for me to park here rather than go up to the car park at John Hunter. The park and ride service hit the road in 2007 as a response to the lack of on-site parking at the campus. Earlier this week, Hunter New England Health announced it will stop in September, a decision that's met with community opposition. Devastated. Yeah, devastated. We haven't got a hospital at um, Nelson Bay, so I don't know what I'm going to do. Make sure I have the funds or not come to hospital. With an additional 740 car spaces due to open at the hospital next month, the chief executive says the free shuttle bus will no longer be needed and that the money will be redirected into frontline services. $10 million has been spent expanding the existing car park. Labor MP Sonia Hornery says she'll be asking the Health Minister for additional funding to keep the shuttle running. This is a good service that doesn't cost the community and the John Hunter much money. Let's keep it um, for the benefit of our community. Amanda Douglas, NBN News. It's a case of so far so good when it comes to visible black dust in the Lower Hunter. Interim findings show that readings from 12 sites across the area are well below the EPA's acceptable air quality level. I think the concentrations of particles in the Newcastle region are quite reasonably good compared to several other places around Australia. The monitoring program began in October last year and will continue for a further six months to ensure that seasonal variations are considered. The release of the results was timely with an annual environmental workshop underway in Newcastle. We're focusing on what the problems are with the fine particles, potential health difficulties, sources and emissions and modelling. Today also saw the launch of a book that chronicles the city's history of pollution describing how industry, transport and manufacturing made a lasting impact. What we've been able to trace is that Newcastle's air pollution problem started probably by the mid-19th century and increased with coal mining and the addition of industries but then really skyrocketed with the opening of BHP in 1915. And there's one period that stands out more than any other. The worst year in the book that we talk about is 1939 where we had 40,000 kilograms of particles in the atmosphere per day. Michael Kane, NBN News. It would have been incredible for the recent storm that we had in April uh, because it, it, it has the capacity to take uh, six-man crew uh, and, and with all the, the facilities it has on it. We're getting more and more people coming in for, for various reasons. Uh, for a lot of those are coming in financial reasons, they just can't afford to get that wholesome meal all the time. He's played more than 60 games in the NRL and at 25, Dynamis Louis is coming into his prime. The Samoan International showed interest in joining the Knights 
but the club didn't respond to his manager's inquiries. Jake Maymo's time in the NRL continues to grow. He'll get another shot in the top grade with Newcastle this weekend. There's a couple of different pathways for me to find my way in the team at the moment, so currently just sitting there and hopefully, like you said, I can play out the rest of the season, but we'll wait and see. Kurt Gidley's departure at season's end means the number one jersey will be vacant. Dane Gagai has spent time at the back at different stages this year, but Maymo wants to secure the position long term. I've been training a lot of fullback and hopefully I can solidify that spot. I'm at that stage of my career, I'm still trying to cement a spot in first grade, so every game I get I've got to take those opportunities and perform as well as I can and I'm, hopefully I've been doing that. A player with blinding speed, Maymo is the first to admit his skills need work. He was peppered with bombs by the Broncos, but adapting to the role in general play is his priority. Definitely my ball playing. I've, I've grown up playing centre or wing, so that's not exactly a ball playing position. So making the transition to fullback, there's a lot more catch pass. And I think my progress in that has come leaps and bounds in the last couple of months. The Hunters finished the season with 10 wins and 6 losses to wind up 4th in the Waratah League. Their opponents this weekend, the Hornsby Spiders, finished one spot lower but beat Newcastle in both of their games. At home, I, I honestly believe we should have won that game. We sort of let that slip at, at the end. Um, down in Hornsby, it was a much different situation. They just shot the lights out. There was nothing we could do. We haven't beaten them yet, but if we want to win a championship, we have to beat every team in the league, so it starts this week. Newcastle's build-up to the playoffs hasn't been ideal. A strange schedule has seen the girls play just four games in eight weeks. We're used to having a game every weekend. Every Saturday we've got a good two-hour slog of, of, of basketball and without that, you know, it does put a dent in, in the um, fitness regime, I guess. On a positive note, that's given Susie Wormsley plenty of time to recover from the broken finger she suffered six weeks ago. We're lucky with our team this year. We have a, a deep bench, so um, one game, if one person doesn't play well, another person will step up. Mitchell Hughes, NBN News. Uh, yeah, it was awesome. Um, I think this is the third year that we haven't, um, that we got on the podium. They're young, talented and desperate to showcase their latest work. Fittingly, it's about social media, the benefits and drawbacks. Give it a like. Go crazy. You might go wild. Give that subscribe button a click. Who knows what'll happen? We were talking about Facebook and all kinds of different medias and we started talking about all the pictures that we always see and it's like, well, no one cares about your cat. You know, it was just a, a phrase that came up in conversation. Now, Newcastle's Tantrum Youth Arts is set to harness the positive power of the medium with a crowdfunding campaign. It's a sign of increasingly difficult times. At the moment, we're in a situation that we haven't really been in for a long time, and that's that we don't have any project funding at all for this production, No One Cares About Your Cat. So we're having to get a little bit inventive about how we try and fund it. The campaign will launch on August 1 via the Possible website. We're really, really hopeful that we can get $10,000 with a well set up, well orchestrated campaign. With community support, the production will open in Newcastle and Sydney in September.